Assalamu alaikum. This presentation is on salivary oral mucoceles. Salivary oral mucoceles are the most common non-neoplastic cysts in the minor salivary glands. They form about 16% of all oral lesions in the pediatric uh, population. The incidence is high, as high as 2.5 lesions per thousand individuals in that age group. It is the second most frequent benign soft tissue lesion of the oral cavity following only irritative fibromas. These mucoceles originate from minor salivary glands and they usually form a single blue or translucent sessile dome-shaped swelling in the oral cavity. They can occur in both genders almost equally and can affect any age group. But patients aged between 11 and 17 form about two-thirds of the patients involved with this type of lesion. It has a very weak male predilection and can occur even in neonates. It's estimated that may be somewhere between 600 and 1,000 minor salivary glands in the oral cavity, distributed along the buccal mucosa, the floor of the mouth, the ventral a surface of the tongue, the heart and soft palate, and even the pharynx. They have their own individual ducts to drain saliva into the oral cavity. Mucoceles arising on the ventral surface of the tongue, like the one shown here, are special. They are known as mucoceles of the glands of Blandin Noon. These glands are located near the ventral tip of the tongue and are arranged in a mass with a horseshoe uh, distribution, horseshoe uh, shape on the ventral surface of the tongue. And what's peculiar about them is that they are, these minor salivary glands are actually embedded into the muscles on the ventral aspect of the tongue near the tip and near the midline. And that's why its treatment is also uh, special because uh, reaching these minor salivary glands may not be straightforward. How do they form? There are two important etiological factors here. Number one is trauma to the minor salivary glands in the buccal cavity, particularly the lower lip and the tongue. And number two is obstruction of the drainage of these minor salivary glands. The trauma factor can cause spillage of saliva from the minor salivary gland and its duct into the surrounding submucosal tissue. This will cause inflammation due to the stagnant mucus, and then the uh, mucus would be walled off by granulation tissue, and this would form a pseudocapsule not lined by epithelium and that would form a non epithelial lined pseudocyst. It's the a trauma in the form of things like uh, li lip biting, for example, usually unnoticed usually a habit that represents the main etiological factor for the most of these uh, extravasation mucoceles. The other factor, obstruction of the salivary gland ducts, would give rise to a different subset of the mucoceles, a mucus retention cyst, which is quite rare in comparison to the pseudo cysts. Uh, it's caused by obstruction of the outflow of the saliva from the minor salivary gland, followed by extravasation into the surrounding tissue, uh, and this would result in a cyst lined by epithelium form, forming a mucoceal. So these are the two types of the salivary mucoceles. The common type, the extravasation type, due to spillage of saliva outside the minor salivary gland due to injury of the duct or the minor salivary gland itself, the spilled saliva will excite an inflammatory reaction and will be walled off by granulation tissue with inflammatory cells and even giant cells in here. There will be no epithelial lining, just a pseudo cyst. This is by far the most common type, accounting for about 90% of the uh, cases of salivary mucoceles. If they are close enough to the mucous membrane of the oral cavity, they will be termed superficial mucoceles. The other type, the retention, 
mucosal is formed within the minor salivary gland due to the blockage of the drainage, the blockage of the duct of the minor salivary gland. So the bulk of the retained mucus will be within the uh, minor salivary gland, even if there is little spillage to the outside, and the cyst will be lined by epithelium. This is by far less common than the extravasation type. Diagnosis would be made on clinical grounds. It's soft, compressible, and painless mass that may have either a bluish or translucent color. It may be associated with previous oral surgery or injury to the oral cavity, or even previous tumors in the uh, oral cavity. And it enlarges very slowly. It has a dome shaped, and the size varies from uh, just less than 0.3 centimeters, just less than 3 millimeters to 22 millimeters. Uh, occasionally, they can be multiple, but by far the vast majority are single uh, mucoceles, and rarely they can develop suddenly at uh, meal time. They usually affect the lower lip, the inside of the lower lip, particularly the lateral part. This is a common site for lip biting. Uh, so about 87% of them would be located in this area, followed by the floor of the mouth, about 7%, and the ventral surface of the tongue in about 5%. They can rupture easily and they release a viscid salty mucus. They are retained and saliva within the cyst. Extravasation mucoceles are more frequent in the young population, whereas uh, retention mucoceles would be seen more often in the um, uh, middle to later part of life. Some of these mucoceles would resolve spontaneously, would just rupture and resolve spontaneously. Some would recur either in the same site or nearby. Most of the mucoceles would require some form of treatment, either removal surgically or by lasers, or by other agents like uh, sclerotherapy, injection, intralesional injections of steroids, or applications of some um, medications on top of the cyst. The application of tincture iodine was tried in the management of these oral mucoceles. Tincture iodine is known to promote fibrosis and flatten epithelial cells. But the response is usually poor. It has a poor curative effect. And also there may be tincture uh, iodine leakage and overdose, which may cause tissue necrosis surrounding the mucoceal. A Chinese medication, pinjiangmycin, which is basically an anti-tumor antibiotic uh, of the bleomycin group, it is basically upgrades the expression of the P53 promoting cellular apoptosis. Um, but it has multiple adverse reactions, such as fever and pulmonary fibrosis and anaphylactic shocks and necrosis, and it's not widely used in the management of mucoceles. Another sclerotherapy agent is the OK432. This is produced from group A streptococcus pyogenes. It's again an antineoplastic uh, medication that produces selective fibrosis uh, and things like lymphangioma but it is usually painful and results in poor compliance, especially in the young patients. Sclerotherapy with absolute ethanol injection is also painful and may cause peripheral tissue uh, liquefaction and necrosis. Cryotherapy was also tried and perhaps is still uh, being tried, but it requires repeated sessions and the targeting accuracy is low. Sclerotherapy with polydecanol is promising. This agent can induce endothelial lysis and can cause destruction of vessels, blood vessels, and subsequent uh, trigger of intravascular thrombosis. It's widely used in the treatment of venous malformations and lymphatic malformations, and even mucus cysts in fingers. It's much more effective 
on mucosils affecting the lips than it is on mucosils originating in the ventral surface of the tongue. As discussed earlier, these mucosils originate from a group of minor salivary glands that are embedded a bit deeper into the muscle layer of the tongue on the ventral surface and precise um, uh, directing the injection to the affected minor salivary gland is not as straightforward as it is on the lower lips. But polydecanol sclerotherapy has obvious advantages in that there is no need for anesthesia and it's a simpler procedure injecting the agent into the mucosil, less invasive than open surgery and have fewer uh, adverse reactions and perhaps higher cure rate. It does not affect the appearance of the patient. These cysts tend to uh, resolve very well without uh, leaving any traces on the surface, uh, so they don't affect the appearance or the function of the uh, lesion uh, region. And more importantly, they are more compliant by most of the children who compose a large proportion of the mucosal patients. But surgical management remains the most common way of treating mucosils, oral mucosils. They can be as simple as just marsupialization of the uh, cyst. Uh, this can have varying success rates and can be done in various methods. It can be just a simple intraolar incision over the doom of the mucosil or lasers can be used to do the same, just vaporize the dome of the cyst. This would be followed by drainage of the cyst into the oral cavity and allows the pseudocyst to drain directly with the oral cavity. Problem with marsupialization is high recurrence rate. That's why transoral excision rather than just marsupialization is still the most common uh, practice used in the treatment of mucosils. But great care should be taken to prevent rupture of the cyst during dissection, as this is the main cause of recurrence, incomplete resection. Once the cyst ruptures, it would be difficult to completely remove it because it has evacuated its mucus and the cyst wall is very thin. Surgical excision, however, can cause um, intraoperative bleeding sometimes, swelling after surgery, and some scarring and fibrosis. And the operation may also damage adjacent minor salivary glands ducts or acini and cause further recurrence or a new uh, crop of mucosils. When open surgical excision is performed in the management of mucosils, it's usually carried out by hydrodissection of the mucosil with saline, um, the saline used with lidocaine and epinephrine um, for uh, local anesthesia. This is known to decrease the complications and the ruptures rate of the cyst. Hydrodissection allows improved visual distinction between the wall of the cyst and the surrounding tissue and the normal mucous membrane. And compared with other techniques, hydrodissection as associated with less bleeding and fewer incidents of tissue damage or neural damage and lower recurrence rate. This, this is the usual um, practice now to use hydrodissection. So after application of povidine iodine as an antiseptic, operation is started with the injection of the local anesthesia, the saline and the lidocaine, one or two percent lidocaine with the uh, 100,000 epinephrine around the cyst. And then an elliptical excision is, um, is marked around the mucosil and the whole mucosil together with the overlying mucosa will be removed down to the muscle layer. This is important to remove the minor salivary glands uh, attached to the cyst wall. And then the wound is closed with interrupted uh, sutures, absor uh, absorbable sutures, uh, so, and the healing is usually very satisfactory because there is usually no tension on the wall. There is redundant mucosa around 
and the healing is usually perfect in this area due to the vascularity. The other uh, common surgical choice would be the use of carbon dioxide laser ablation for the mucosal. Now, whether it's a cold steel or electrosurgery or cryosurgery or laser, regardless of the technique, the important thing is to reach the uh, muscle layer, the underneath muscle layer be below the mucosal uh, to ensure dissection of the affected minor salivary gland. Uh, when this, this can be achieved in various ways, including cold steel or laser, like in here, and the healing following both procedures is quite satisfactorily. But when uh, the two techniques, open surgery and carbon dioxide laser, were um, compared uh, by a, a randomized trial, it was found that conventional surgical removal has a recurrence rate around 8.8%, and post-operative complications of about 13%. Uh, now, the reported success rate for the carbon dioxide was uh, almost uh, no relapses at all after a follow-up period of 12 months and also no reported complications. So uh, the uh, suggested um, message from the authors of the trial was that the oral mucosal ablation with carbon dioxide laser would be uh, more predictable results and fewer complications and lesser uh, rate of recurrence compared to conventional uh, surgery with cold steel. By this, we come to the end of this presentation on oral salivary mucoseals. Assalamu alaikum.